Thank you for stopping by. I'm Bill Farley, the second great-grandnephew of Jim Murray, and the author of a new biography of this iconic classic, Western Pioneer. The title of my book is James A. Murray, Butte's Radical Irish Millionaire. In this video, I'll tell you how I pieced together his hidden story, explain why he remained a secret for so long, and introduce you to the organization of the book. But first, let me tell you how I came across this radical Irish relative. I discovered James A. Murray shortly after my father passed away in 2012. As I sorted through his family history papers, one newspaper article caught my attention. It was an obituary for Murray that described the breadth of his holdings under the title, Prominent in the Development of the Entire West. The article also mentioned he was fond of practical jokes. He sounded like somebody I'd like to get to know. First, because my career involved similar businesses, and second, because I also like practical jokes. As a quick aside, let me say that this practical joke narrative did not turn out to be true. The only one laughing at these jokes was Murray. Murray's idea of a joke involved rigging bets in his favor. One version that is often told involves a load of wood planks. Murray would stop a gentleman, like this one, outside of town, count the planks in his wagon, and then arrange for the man to park outside a saloon. There, Murray would wager the unsuspecting patrons on the number of planks in the man's load. Murray used the term cinches to describe these antics, and he would clear hundreds of dollars at a time. He continued pulling these jokes, even as he amassed a multi-million dollar fortune. Today, we might describe Murray as a cheat rather than a practical joker. In David Emmons' forward, he drives this point home, writing, Murray was also a consummate cheater, and as this terrific book makes clear, he cheated at everything. Random bets, cards, banking, the buying and selling of mines, and every other kind of property that he added to his remarkable portfolio. He cheated strangers, cheated his friends, cheated his family. Given the time and place, Jim Murray must have been either the luckiest or the toughest or the most disarmingly charming man in the room. As Farley's biography makes clear, he was a lot of all three. The luckiest, toughest, and most disarmingly charming man in the room. That is a great description of the man I found in my research. This map indicates the geographic reach of my research. The red markers stretching from San Diego up the Pacific coast through the Rocky Mountains and across the country to Washington, D.C. indicate the locations I visited to retrieve remnants of Murray's life. The gold markers indicate primary sources, actual letters written by or to Murray by his partners. Murray did not save papers on his own, but two of his partners, Sandbar Brown and Ed Fletcher did so. Fletcher's papers included original letters from Murray that corroborated the biting wit that came through in contemporary news reports of his dealings. The markers in green illustrate the location of three academic conferences, in which I presented aspect of his story, and the blue dots represent journals and a trade article in which parts of his story are told. This map reflects the footprint of Murray's business dealings across the country. In Montana, his primary residence from the 1860s to 1905, he owned mines, resorts, commercial real estate, waterworks, newspapers, and theaters. In Pocatello, he owned a water company, a newspaper, two banks, and a theater. In Seattle, he was one of the largest landowners in the Central Business District at the turn of the century. And in San Diego, he developed a significant water company, which included the largest dam in Southern California. Monterey, California became his second home, and there he engaged in a number of charitable endeavors. If I wanted to romanticize his life, I could have played up his time in this beautiful seaside town. Finally, Murray left quite an impression on the New York entertainment scene, with his frequent visits to take in the theater and as a regular at the bar in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. With such an expansive footprint and given his great wealth, an obvious question is, why have we not heard of this character before? I see three reasons for the oversight. Superstitions, sardines, and extortion. Murray was very superstitious about publicity. He did not care to see his name in the limelight. He did not put his name on buildings or let charitable organizations recognize his contributions. He certainly never submitted a biography to contemporary books that featured successful pioneers. This is also reflected in the scarcity of pictures of Murray. These are the four pictures that I have of Murray. You do not find him mugging for the camera next to his racehorses or performers at his theaters or at the mansions or his sprawling resorts. 
These rare photos capture Murray after his frontier life between ages of 50 and 80, spanning 1890 to 1920, just before his death. Another reason his life is hidden is that he left no mansion behind. In Butte, we know W.A. Clark was a force in town because of the mansions he built for himself and his son, Charlie. Murray chose to live in a modest apartment above his bank at Copper and Main. He continued to do so even after he acquired the Clark Chateau through foreclosure. He opted to lease the Chateau to a music school instead of making it his residence. In Monterey, where he did own a mansion, more in keeping with Gilded Age excess, sardines, a very tiny fish, wiped out any trace of his great wealth. This is the Murray Hacienda in Monterey, California. It spanned a thousand feet of undulating coastline and is located immediately adjacent to the area that developed as Cannery Row, the subject of one of John Steinbeck's great novels. During the early 1900s, you could buy at least three different postcards that featured the mansion. Murray passed away in the mansion in 1921, and his widow and stepson held onto the home until the 1940s, when a boom in sardine fishing surrounded the home with canneries. The red box indicates the primary location of Cannery Row, and the yellow outline is Murray's former estate. The expansion of Cannery Row during the boom years joined the two areas together. The stepson sold the home and acquired a ranch in Carmel Valley. A simple plaque, some footings, and one small section of an exterior wall are all that remain. Certainly nothing that would give us an impression that Murray had great wealth. The footprint of the former mansion is now occupied by a four-star hotel on one side, a business class hotel on the other, and in between are remnants of the sardine processing plants that succeeded the demolition of the grand estate. So if we have superstition and sardines as two primary reasons that Murray's life has been hidden from history. A third reason is that he was a frequent combatant with local communities. Murray was no one's hometown hero. He made part of his fortune by extorting money from local governments and their residents. A prime example of this is in Butte, Montana. As copper mining activities soared with the need for telephone and electrical wiring, Murray purchased two mining claims in the heart of Butte's central business district, the Arctic and the Smokehouse. Business owners could not build on their properties, nor could the city operate and maintain streets without the threat of Murray demolishing their improvements to access his claims. Business owners and the city were forced to pay Murray an annual fee to protect their holdings from his wrecking ball. The city sued Murray for years to free downtown properties from these ransom payments, eventually winning. But the battle for many left Murray as a hometown villain, one they would just as soon forget. Superstition, sardines, and extortion. These are the three reasons that I think no one took up Murray's unique and fascinating story. In his biography, I've reconstructed his life from remnants collected across the country, which includes how he built his great wealth, his passion for freeing his mother country from England's rule, and the eclectic group of characters whom he embraced, from his early days in the remote mining camps until his last breath in his seaside mansion. It is these captive characters that enriched his life and bring together in one amazing life so many aspects of the American West. I've organized these characters for this introduction into four groups. First, there are the sidekicks. Fat Jack, hack driver to presidents and celebrities. Sandbar Brown, a fur trapper, partner and local historian. And John McGuire, Murray's closest friend and operator of his chain of theaters. Then there are the Copper Kings, the wealthiest men in the West, Augustus Hines, W.A. Clark, and Marcus Daly. Murray managed to remain partners with each of them, while Clark and Hines battled Daly's corporation for Dominus and Butte. The third group is family. Murray held his company affairs close. He didn't have any children on his, of his own, so he relied on extended family members to operate or hide assets under their names. His first wife, Sarah Burchett House, was daughter to mining camp judge B.B. Burchett, who worked beside the infamous sheriff, Harry Plummer. Murray's second wife, twice divorced, Mary Coulter Smith Haldorn, forged documents after Murray's death to seize control of his vast holdings. And James E. Murray, a nephew, operated Murray's businesses and led the political fight for Ireland's freedom after the end of World War I. And finally, the last group is the Irish radicals. Among them, Judge Jeremiah Lynch, Larry Dugan, and Bill Dunn. Murray was closely associated with a radical fringe of Irish Americans from the 1880s until his passing. 
These relationships resulted in some extraordinary dealings that drew the attention of military intelligence agencies during and after the Great War. Colorful sidekicks, copper kings, family, and Irish radicals, these colorful associates cutting across class and political lines make Murray's biography truly unique. To tell this unique story, I've organized the book in three sections. The first section covers his rise to great wealth and the brutality this involves, while introducing the characters that become lifelong friends. The second section covers how he spent his fortune and includes a comparison with other tycoons from both the East and West Coast. The final section covers the end of Murray's life, including the final push for Ireland's freedom and the fight over his estate. After you've completed the entire book, I suggest that you continue to the appendix and read the contemporary obituaries for Murray, Fat Jack, and John McGuire. These romanticized versions of their lives illustrate how selective memories can shape our history and hide our untidy and vastly more interesting past. I owe gratitude to the librarian archivist I met along the way for preserving material which permitted me to expose, to the best of my ability, all sides of Murray and his eclectic group of friends. I hope you enjoy his story and feel free to send me comments on my website, billfarley.net, my Facebook page, or my author's page on Goodreads. If you're interested in seeing some the source material for the book and more images, please vi visit my Pinterest page, which shares the same title. Thank you and good reading.